so first off, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about my research. This is research done um, jointly with uh, Kartik Iyer, Jörg Schumacher, and um, <clears throat> Sweeney. And uh, this uh, research was published in uh, 2020. Um, so just first to set the stage, um, I'm talking about Rayleigh Barnard convection for experimentally realistic boundary conditions in cylindrical containers. So just a brief, to briefly describe Rayleigh Barnard convection, it's a layer of fluid heated from below, cooled from the top, and in this case in a cylindrical container. Um, and I'm interested in case, the case of Prandtl 1, and I'm looking at aspect ratios, I'll just circle right down here, um, less than one as well. And my interest is basically in um, heat transport um, at high Rayleigh number. We've heard a couple other talks in this meeting about this. Um, how does Nusselt number scale with Rayleigh when Rayleigh gets really, really high for this particular system? Um, is the scaling exponent one third? That's been seen for you know more moderate, uh, Rayleigh really numbers, or does is there eventually a transition to the ultimate regime where that scaling exponent beta becomes one half, or maybe one half with logarithmic corrections? Um, so to set the stage, the experiments that were done, I'm just listing the locations they were done. There were many great experimenters who did this research in all of the groups, and I have great respect for these experiments. They're pretty amazing what they've done. Um, and the range of experiments, as far as I'm aware of, are from 10 to the 16th to 10 to the 15th in Rayleigh number, and aspect ratios between 0.5 and 1. And the results for a sharp transition in scaling exponent um, are mixed. Some groups don't see any transition from a scaling exponent of something close to one third. And then there are some other groups, the Göttingen and Grenoble groups, that have seen some sort of indication that there might be some change in scaling exponent for the highest Rayleigh numbers. Um, and then the DNS, as far as I'm aware of, and again, if anyone knows of any other results, please feel free to let me know after this talk, um, were Stevens, who went to Rayleigh number two times 10 to the 12th for aspect ratios one half and one quarter, and did not see any transition in scaling exponent. And so my interest is in trying to push these DNS simulations to um, higher Rayleigh number. So um, just to put up the equations I'll be using, uh, the dimensionless Boussinesque equations consisting of um, momentum equation, the heat equation and incompressibility. U will stand for velocity field in this case, T for temperature, P for pressure. I think you all know Rayleigh number and Prandtl number, um, but defined here with these parameters. Uh, and then as I said, aspect ratio, I'm using, I'm defining it as diameter to depth for these cylindrical containers. Uh, probably the most important thing on this slide is how I uh, scale my variables um, with free fall velocity. So velocities are scaled with that, temperature with delta T, and then uh, uh, any lengths with height H, giving these equations this form with these various really parental number uh, values scattered in between. And the reason we like this numerically, though, is that uh, with this scaling, the velocity and temperature fields tend to be, uh, at least for parental one, about the same magnitude, making it a little bit easier to simulate. Okay, so um, I'll just have this slide to show my, uh, uh, the, so a little bit about the code that we use, which is uh, NEC 5000, written by Paul Fisher at Argonne National Lab 30 years ago, and it's still good today, I would have to say. It's a great code and scales very well with processors. Um, and again, I said I'm looking for at aspect ratio 0.1, parental equal to one. And I have these Rayleigh numbers, and this is just gonna, this table illuminates the uh, different resolutions that we use and our run times. Um, but just looking on the right side here, you see this is an example uh, uh, mesh that we use. Um, this is a spectral element method. So this is showing the elements uh, for this particular case. Um, and you might wonder, well, why are we using aspect ratio 0.1? Um, but we want really fine resolution um, for the code. We wanna make sure that the results that we have aren't uh, due to any uh, lack of resolution. So we're working really hard to resolve all the structures, not only on the sidewalls and on the boundary plates, but in the interior of the container as well, because all these fine structures can be throughout the container. Um, so as I said, that's why we need the, the resolution. So here's Rayleigh number, N is the polynomial order. So for each element, that's the number of grid points in each length per element. NE is the total number of elements. 
NEZ gives you the number of elements in the Z direction, and then any N cubed is actually the total number of grid points, um, which as you can see for the highest Rayleigh numbers is a lot of grid points. Um, so these are really massive calculations. The largest runs were done on Myra at Argonne National Lab with over half a million parallel processors. Um, and then the runtime, that's basically how many free fall times did we run out to? And I really, really wish these numbers for the highest two Rayleigh numbers were larger, but that's as far as we could get um, in this case. And uh, just to mention for 10 to the 14th, that one ran for about 75 million supercomputing hours and 10 to the 15th used well over 100 million supercomputing hours. So these are massive simulations um, in this case. Um, let's see. So one other thing I wanted to mention, um, the boundary conditions that I'm using, um, they're the, for velocity, it's no slip boundary conditions on all sides. And then for the temperature, it's insulating along the boundaries, sorry, along the sidewalls, excuse me. And then the bottom plate is at a fixed hot temperature and the top plate at a fixed cold temperature. Okay, so I'd like to get into the weeds just a little bit and talk a bit about how we determine the salt number for these cases. Um, this is an example of really 10 to the 14th that I'm showing here, a no salt number as a function of time scaled with that free fall time units. This is the whole simulation that we did. Um, so first I just wanna mention how we compute no salt number here. We're actually looking at the heat flux through the bottom and top plate. Um, you can also compute no salt number from the UZT. And we did that as well, but we found that that quantity fluctuated more than the heat flux through the bottom and top plates. So in order to have good statistical, statistical convergence with that quantity, we had to run for even longer and we were already fairly limited because of these massive simulations. So we really like the quantity, uh, as I said, the heat flux through the bottom and top plate to use that to compute no salt number. Um, another thing I want to highlight, you notice that we're using different resolutions here. So we have a fixed element grid for Rayleigh 10 to the 14th. And then what we can do to change the resolution is change the polynomial order um, in that case. And we do that, as you can see, uh, periodically in this case. Um, I'd also like to mention the initial conditions because you may be curious about that. Um, for Rayleigh less than 10 to the 14th, we used random initial conditions, so like random perturbations to the temperature conduction field. Um, but we found that for, and we tended to do that, you know, starting with fairly low resolution, run it out for a long time to have it settle, and then we'd start going to finer and finer resolution, as you can see here at the end of this run. Um, but we did find that for really 10 to the 14th and 10 to the 15th, um, to start with random initial conditions, we needed such a fine resolution that we were worried we'd never quite get to the settled state situation or the steady, I wouldn't call it steady state solution, but the case where things have been running for a long time. So as a result, what we did instead is we used the settled state for Rayleigh 10 to the 13th, that's what we started out here, switched the Rayleigh number to 10 to the 14th, um, and then ran that out for a long time at fairly coarse resolution, and then started ramping up the resolution, which is what we did here. And we did that also for 10 to the 15th as well. Um, and that's why you see these sharp transitions. That's when the resolution is changing and this, we need, it's not a clean restart. So you get these jumps. Um, another thing we found that we like to do is to change the resolution. Notice we went from n equals seven to three and then back to seven. That enabled us in the, the region where we had the course of resolution to run out longer to sample more of state space. Because one thing we were finding is that sometimes the system would be in sort of one flow state for a very long time and would take a while to kick it out into another state. And we wanted to try to sample as many flow states as we could for these simulations. Um, so this, for this particular case, then, the no salt number was found for the region in the arrows. Um, and that's what we were reporting out. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of the details of that. Um, I'd also like to show some data now on temperature and velocity profiles that we found for these cases. Um, so in all cases, the um, horizontal axis is the Z value. So what we did is we did an area average grid plane by grid plane, so we're plotting these quantities as a function of Z. Um, and the first, the left plot is temperature, uh, basically. Um, and then this is for um, Rayleigh numbers 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 15th. And you see the typical profile is a very steep drop in temperature at the bottom boundary layer plate, I said bottom plate, um, and then a more moderate drop in temperature throughout the bulk of the container, and then another steep drop near the top plate. And then finding that um, as really increases, the temperature drop in the bulk tends to be uh, shallower and shallower. 
Um, and then in the middle plot, we then did a zoom in near the bottom boundary plate of the previous plot. Um, and you can see the boundary layer thicknesses getting thinner as the um, Rayleigh number increases. This also gives you a sense of our resolution because these are our grid points as well. Um, and then the uh, right plot shows the RMS velocity as a function of Z and similarly seeing the velocity boundary layer thickness getting thinner as the Rayleigh number increases. All right, so um, I also wanted to show boundary layer thicknesses. You can actually go back again, measure these quantities, the boundary layer thicknesses. Um, lambda indicates boundary layer thickness, uh, T for temperature, V for velocity in this case. Um, although you can actually do two different types of averages. You could either do uh, an air area average over the entire plate, bottom plate and top plate, that would be uh, less than 0 0.05 in our case. Um, you can also do a bulk average where you're averaging over just an interior region, in this case, uh, less than 0 0.03, um, cutting out the sidewall effects. And so I, we plotted both of these as functions of Rayleigh number on this plot. And one thing that you see is that for high enough Rayleigh number, all the quantities are fairly similar. Um, you'd expect the thermal and velocity boundary layers to be about the same since Prandtl is one, but it's also nice to see that the bulk and area average quantities are similar, indicating that there aren't a lot of sidewall effects for the very high Rayleigh numbers. Okay, um, here's another diagnostic quantity, which is wall shear stress and velocity gradients, excuse me. Um, so the wall shear stress is computed in this way. So it's basically um, vertical derivatives of the horizontal velocity components combined in this way with ratios of Prandtl and Rayleigh on there. Um, and I'm showing that on the left plot here. This is, these are PDFs of the wall shear stress at the bottom plate at z equals zero. Um, for many different Rayleigh numbers, and the PDFs are normalized to be one. And then on the horizontal axis, we're plotting the wall shear stress divided by the wall shear stress at the maximum value in the PDF in each case. Um, and you see that all of the PDFs collapse so that there's no clear change in this quantity um, as Rayleigh increases. Likewise, we looked at the uh, velocity gradient of the, uh, the X component of the velocity. Um, and the derivative in the z direction. And then in this case, the horizontal axis is divided by the RMS value. And these are again PDFs. And we see here also that these quantities collapse on one another. So there's no clear change as Rayleigh really increases. And then on the right plot, we're actually plotting this quantity, um, uh, just the RMS value of the velocity gradient as a function of Rayleigh, seeing a slow, steady increase as Rayleigh increases. Okay. So then the next thing I want to show are some visualizations. These are some pretty beautiful visualizations in my opinion. Um, this is of the boundary layer structure, um, not to let you think that it's a very you know, uniform boundary layer. There's a lot of structure in there. So this is basically a horizontal cut through the bottom boundary layer um, showing for really 10 to the 11th in the left column, middle column for 10 to the 13th and right column really 10 to the 15th showing temperature in the top row, streamlines in the middle row, and wall shear stress, as I defined in the previous slide, on the bottom row. Um, and one thing you can see here is that as really increases, the structures become finer and finer and finer in the boundary layer. Um, and remember, this is aspect ratio 0.1. So the fine structures, let's say at really to 10 to the 15th, are really, you know, the structures are a lot smaller than um, this aspect ratio, um, indicating that um, certainly aspect ratio 0 0.1, um, we're thinking is, is, even though it's small, it's large enough to really be able to see uh, some fine structure and uh, determine Nusselt number for these cases. All right, so the next thing I want to do is show different aspect ratios to compare, because we do have some data for aspect ratio 1, and in this case uh, for Prandtl 1 as well. Um, that's the top row. So these are the same quantities, temperature, streamlines, and wall shear stress. Um, and then we have aspect ratio 0.1 on the bottom row. So these are, you know, so the top row and the bottom row are not at the same scale, right? Because <laughs> it's one aspect ratio one versus 0.1. So what we did is we took then a section of the aspect ratio one case and uh, blew it up to be on the same scale as the aspect ratio 0.1 case. So the middle and bottom rows are the same scale. Um, except that the middle row is for aspect ratio one and the bottom for aspect ratio 0.1. Um, but the takeaway message here is we see that these structures actually look very similar in size for those two aspect ratios, indicating that the smaller aspect ratio isn't really changing the size of the structures in the boundary layer. 
Okay, so those are some visualizations. Now to um, some data on NOSALT number. I already discussed how we computed NOSALT number um, for the uh, very high relay number cases. Um, and so let's see. So one thing we have, we have data already for Prandtl point seven aspect ratio one. And so that's the uh, blue square, squares that I'm showing. And then the new data um, that I'm talking about today are for um, aspect ratio 0.1, parental one, those are the red circles. Um, one thing that's nice to see on this Nusselt Rayleigh plot is that for the uh, region where the data overlap, the same Rayleigh numbers, we find that the Nusselt numbers look very similar. So that's very promising again that for the smaller aspect ratio, we're getting similar results in Nusselt number. Then we went ahead and uh, did a fit to the parental point the aspect ratio 0.1 data, the red circles, and that's the fit given here for an assault number as really to the 0.331. Um, and it's fairly good agreement with uh, the Malchus prediction of a scaling exponent of one third. And the prefactor is also, you know, fairly close to what's predicted by Spiegel um, as well. So um, pretty happy with those results. Um, and then um, to, in order to determine how good this fit actually is, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a compensated plot on the next page, um, which is right here. So taking notional and scaling with really to the 0.331. And if you have a horizontal line that indicates that the scaling is good for the entire range, and it's actually, you know, that these data points are fairly horizontal for the highest really numbers. Uh, not true for the lower really numbers. The scaling exponent for that data is closer to about 0.3. Uh, but what's nice to see is that for both aspect ratios, again, the overlap is fairly good. Okay, um, let's see. So one thing that's not the same for the two different aspect ratios is Reynolds number. So I wanna briefly talk about this as well. Um, so Reynolds number is defined as the RMS, the way we, we calculate it is to find the volume and time average of the RMS velocity. Again, scalar, scaled with some factors of really and Prandtl to get the units right. Um, and so here I'm already showing the compensated plot of uh, the scaling exponent that we uh, find for um, the uh, aspect ratio 0.1 case, which is 0.458. And you can see that the, that data really scales well over the entire range of Rayleigh numbers. Um, however, in contrast, the aspect ratio one data um, is quite different. The Reynolds number is quite a bit higher for that data, almost a factor of five larger for some data points. And the scaling exponent is also different. It's um, closer to 0.49. Um, so here's a case where the, the aspect ratio uh, is making quite a bit of a difference in terms of the uh, momentum transport. And then the question, why is that? Well, let's look at the flow states. Um, and this is for the aspect ratio 0.1 cases. Um, so what I'm showing you here are plots of UZ, the vertical velocity, where blue corresponds to negative 0.1 and red to 0.1. So red would be um, upflow and blue would be downflow. And you end up with these, uh, I would like to call them barber pole flow states, where you have this, um, this flow circling up and then down. Um, you can really, for barely 10 to the 11th, we just show two different points of view. So you can really see that helical structure um, in this particular system. We also show a cut so that the bottom plots are horizontal cuts. Um, on the left is the horizontal cut at mid-plane. And then the second one from the left is a horizontal cut at about a quarter way up. And again, you can see the helical structure in that case. Um, but for all cases, you see a helical structure, even for really 10 to the 13th and 10 to the 15th and all the ones in between as well. Um, and we're uh, also showing here a, a horizontal cut at mid-plane for the other two cases, 10 to the 13th and 10 to the 15th. Um, and it's interesting to note, you can really see how finely scaled the velocity field is getting as the Rayleigh number gets higher and higher. Um, I should highlight, and I have some movies on the next slide, that these uh, flow states um, are not, they're, they're very time dependent, actually. So, um, you know, it doesn't stay stationary the whole time. Um, the, the helicity or the winding number can change. These states will collapse and reform, and they're just very noisy. Uh, but nonetheless, they do does seem to be a very large scale flow state. And this is quite different than what's seen at aspect ratio one. In aspect ratio one, there's just a single large scale circulation convection role. Um, so it's maybe not surprising that the Reynolds number is different because these flow states are quite different. 
All right, so let me just show some movies and I hope you guys can see these. Um, this is for really 10 to the 8th and then I'll do 10 to the 11th and 10 to the 15th. They're a little bit short because we didn't, we weren't planning on making movies when we did this to start with. And so we didn't output the data um, as often as probably would be nice for movies, but nonetheless, you can still get an idea of what they look like. So here's 10 to the 8th and you see that beautiful Barbara's pole structure in that case and a slight drift. I'm not rotating it, it's actually just drifting um, on its own um, as time goes on. For really 10 to the 11th, it's, and again, I apologize, it's very noisy because it, it wasn't output <laughs> uh, finely enough, but you can definitely get a sense of there being very complicated structures. Uh, the, there's always some sort of helicity, but it, it tends to change. Um, and then for 10 to the 15th, we have this really nice, uh, a little bit of a nicer movie. We did output the data more often in that case. And you can see this um, very nice structure, a lot of interesting motion going on in that case. All right, um, so that is uh, my story. So we have well-resolved high Rayleigh number simulations for aspect ratio 0.1 and Prandtl 1. Um, and we've determined scaling laws uh, for heat and momentum transport. For the heat transport, we see Rayleigh to the 0.331. And for the momentum transport, we get a scaling exponent of Rayleigh to the 0.458, at least up to Rayleigh 10 to the 15th. Um, we do find that aspect ratio matters for momentum transport, but not doesn't seem to for heat transport, and that the heat transport scaling is consistent with the one-third power law of Malchus. Um, and then I'd also just like to thank um, our funding and especially the Insight program for allowing us to use their supercomputers. Thank you.